Welcome to the Loire Valley's most graceful chateau, the Chateau of Chenonceau. This was probably our favorite castle that we've visited out here, and this is actually one of the main reasons that we came to the Loire at all, was just to see this gorgeous castle. This won't be an in-depth history of the chateau, it'll just be the parts of it that we found interesting as we walked through and snapped some photos. If you're planning a visit here, there is free parking available. There is a bit of a walk up to the chateau. There are not any restaurants or cafes here that I recall, but there are two picnic areas here, and it would be an amazing place to stop and just sit out and enjoy the lovely scenery here. We got all of our entry tickets for our Loire Valley, the chateaus and things we did there. We got them all at the tourist information office in Amboise, but you can also buy the tickets directly from their website. Chenonceau spans the Cher River. You can also plan to rent a boat here, although we came a little early in the year, I believe, to do that, so we did not do the boating. This stunning place is known as the Chateau of the Ladies, partly because throughout its 500-ish years of history, it was often given to, renovated by, and decorated by the wives, queens, and mistresses of the current owners. This beautiful chateau was built between 1514 and 1522 on the foundation of a much older chateau and mill on the bank of the Cher River, the bridge was actually added much later in 1555. In 1535, it was seized by King Francois Premier, who we met in prior videos, due to unpaid debts to the crown. One of the most interesting links in history that I find with this particular chateau is that it is connected to Henri II and his mistress Diane de Poitiers. He gifted the chateau to Diane in 1547, so they would have come here and spent time in this beautiful setting. We will dive into their story a little bit later in the video, but I will show you the property and the chateau here. This is a property with more to see than just the chateau, however. Inside the chateau is a beautifully restored kitchen. If you love seeing this sort of thing, definitely don't miss the kitchen. The uh, I believe it's a replica, but many very cool things to see. I always love walking through old kitchens and imagining the incredible amount of bustle and craziness and heat that would be going on here during a hosting of a big party given by any of the royalty that were here and just imagine trying to feed a multi-course perfect meal to a horde of royal guests and try to keep everything up to royal standards and keep the food warm and keep it get it all served at the same time so this was very cool to walk through and um, you may see some blurring here i actually blurred out uh, there were a lot of people in these photos actually so i erased them so you can see more of the setting and less of the tourists Another bit of history that we found here that we did not actually expect, it was a terrific bonus, the stables have been converted to a World War I military hospital museum because the chateau was actually a military hospital between 1914 and 1918 when over 2,250 wounded from the war were cared for here. The owner of the chateau, one Gaston Meunier, whose family is still in ownership of the chateau and they are famous for their chocolates. At the time, he volunteered the chateau at his own expense and set up a military hospital for wounded with 120 beds, including an operating room and one of the first x-ray machines. During World War II, the chateau was used as a means of escape like an underground railroad. It was used to smuggle people across through the covered bridge from the occupied France side of the river to the free zone on the opposite bank. It was bombed by the Germans in 1940, they occupied it, and then it was bombed again by the Allies in 1944. There are beautiful grounds to walk through here. There are three gardens you can see. The, the two beside the banks of the river are the most famous. Um, the one was designed by Diane de Poitiers during her residency here, and the other was designed by Henri's queen, Marie de Medici. The third one we did not visit, um, it is called the Green Garden. It was built in 1825 by a later countess who wanted an English style garden. To dive into a little bit of Henri de and Diane de Poitiers' story, a bit of backstory, he was the son, he was actually the second son of King Francois, as we've met prior. Henri became the heir when his brother Francis died at the age of 18 in 1536 after a tennis match. Both sons as children had actually spent four years as hostages in Spain to the King of Spain and it is said that the young seven-year-old Henri, as he was sent into Spain, as they went, I believe they crossed a river, the party that saw them off included one of his grandmother's ladies-in-waiting, one widowed Diane de Poitiers, who was much, much older than him. It wasn't known exactly when their relationship began, but there is a giant age gap, 
As early as 1531, when he was 12 years old, he wore Diane's colors of black and white when attending a tournament, although I don't know that you can read too much into that, he was 12. It's generally accepted that by 1534, based on their correspondence to each other, they were romantically involved at the time. The odd thing about that still being that he was only 15 and she was 35 years old. Diane went out of her way throughout her lifetime to maintain her legendary beauty and her figure. She reportedly swam or bathed in cold water every day in an era when even a warm bath once in a while was considered, you know, excessive. She also was into health. She walked and rode and hunted and even dieted in a time when that wasn't really a thing. She's also said to have drank an elixir containing gold for a lot of her life to preserve her youthful glow. But they proved that this may have in fact been true in 2009. French experts found what was believed to have been part of her skeleton at her final home in the Chateau of Danette outside of Paris, where testing showed that she had actually dangerously high levels of gold in her hair. So her elixir of youth may have contributed to her, her health being poor at the end of her life, although she did live to 66, so she wasn't exactly young when she died. She was actually reburied with honor in 2010 at the Chateau d'Annette. Henri wore Diane's emblems for all of his life, and he stamped their entwined initials everywhere, all through France. You may see many carvings and statues portraying her as Diana the Huntress, but he put their intertwined initials in chateaus and on gates and on floors and on walls and trim detail on his armor, which we did get to see, which is in the military museum in Paris. The initials of HD are everywhere that he spent time. Also, his wife's name was Catherine, so this could be almost portrayed as an H and a C, but it was fairly well understood at, even at the time that this was him and Diane's initials. Diane also had a place as one of the king's main counselors to, to such an extent that he involved her in his royal correspondence and developed a signature that was a combination of their two names together, Henri Diane, and he would sign this at the bottom of his letters. He also put her in charge of his education for his children with Catherine. Um, she was said to have been a respectful mistress and didn't, um, you know, flaunt her relationship with the king, but it must have been a difficult love triangle for the queen. Especially since Henri and Diane's relationship lasted for his entire life from the time he was 15 until his tragic death at the age of 40 in 1559 when he was hit in the eye by the shard of a lance broken off during a joust. He lived for 10 more days beyond this injury in sort of agony of unsuccessful medical treatments during which it is said that doctors actually tried some pretty unorthodox and unpleasant methods to try and recreate the wound and try and find a way to help him recover, which he did not. During his final 10 days, it is said that he repeatedly asked for Diane, but she had been banished immediately by Catherine and not allowed to be with him at his death. The queen also quickly confiscated Chenonceau um, as her own castle and forced Diane to exchange it for another chateau. Diane retired to her chateau d'Annette, where she later died, and Marie went on to make Chenonceau her favorite residence, where she added her own garden, she hung her portrait in Diane's bedroom, and spent a fortune on upgrading the chateau, including adding the now famous covered gallery over that bridge, where she is said to have hosted spectacular parties. In 1560, the first ever fireworks display in France took place here to mark the ascension of Catherine's son to the throne. After Catherine's death, the chateau passed to her son, King Henri Trois' wife, Louise of Lorraine, who was here when she heard of her husband the king's assassination in 1589, after which it is said she fell into a state of depression and spent the next 11 years here aimlessly wandering the chateau's corridors dressed in mourning clothes amidst somber black tapestries stitched with skulls and crossbones. The last king said to have visited here was Louis XIV in 1650. The final thing here and one of the most cool surprises we found was this room that is the apothecary room of Marie de Medici's physicians. And this was just lovely to walk through all these gorgeous bottles. It was wonderful to walk through and wonder what they were using and what they were using them for. Because also as part of the notorious Medici family from Italy, Marie herself was always rumored to have more than a passing interest in using poison to further some of her political means. So who knows what some of these jars contained or what they were used for. Marie herself has an interesting enough story that she's worth looking up on the side. She was fond, they say, of sending people gifts like poisoned gloves. So if you're interested in a sideline history of France, look up Marie de Medici and her adventures through history. 
I hope this inspires you to visit the beautiful, graceful Chateau de Chenon So if you are in the Loire Valley and some of the history and some of the things to see here. Thanks for watching and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.